Okay. It is Wednesday afternoon. It is October 13th. It's the year 2021. And I say that because if you've seen on the website or the, the bit.ly site or if you were with me, you know that originally we started this class in January 2020. But it's been a long time in between, thanks to a little ugly word called COVID. <laughs> we are glad to be back to the course that we were starting on then just coincidentally happens to be in the beginning because we're going all the way back to the beginning and we're starting with the book of Genesis, Bereshit in our Hebrew. And I should have put it on the board ahead. I will put it up now just so you can see it. It doesn't mean that you'll know how to pronounce it from seeing it because it's very hard. Oh, I think we do it without the E. Do we do it without the E? We do it without the E in the Hebrew. Um, remember, the vowels are not there in the Hebrew, so that's how you'll see Bereshit, just in case if you see it written sometime and wonder what's that word. You can see it spelled other ways, too, but this is the closest to the Hebrew, I would say, in its spelling. And it is interesting that for the Jewish people who read through the Torah every year, and that means the first five books of Moses, that they've just recently started back in Genesis again. The scroll was just rolled back up and it was just restarted. So I think they're on their third week. They'll read through the first five books in 52 weeks. So it goes at a, quite a clip. We're not going to catch up with them, trust me. We'll be in Genesis when they recycle and start again and maybe even a second time because we're not here to, to hurry through it. We're here to learn from it. The Hebrew name is given to it because it is one of the first words in the Hebrew text, and that's often how the books were named. They were named by the first couple words in the Hebrew language. Even the parashas, the portions that are read each week by the Jewish people that are given a title, a name, a word, it's always by those first few words of the part that they're reading. So when you hear me get to verse, verse 1 and Sorry, but we, I don't think we'll get there today. It still will be a good class. We'll be in the Word of God. We just won't be in the first verse. But when I get there, you'll hear me say, Bereshit, bara, Elohim, et. That's the first four words. And we'll go into a whole class on those words. And I love that class. One of my favorites to teach. The Bereshit, you heard it. It was the first word. And again, that's what gives us the first word. But at the same time, the meaning of Bereshit is origin. Mm -hmm. It is source. It is generation or beginnings. So to translate Bereshit in the beginning is a very good translation. And as I said, as I put out the text for the class, in the beginning is a great place to start. And we do laugh at that song that, that they begin with Do Re Mi and the, the singing and we'll begin with Bereshit. We'll begin with the Hebrew there. If I gave it to you in Greek, it's Genesis. A little hard for me to say. But that is G-E-N-E-S. Okay, I need to look again. E-O-S? E-O-S. I was right. E-O-S. And did I do that high enough? It's actually, I see it's not showing up on my Zoom. So I don't know if you there in Zoom world can see that. We'll find a way to get around that in the future if you need it. But anyway, again, that means birth. It means genealogy or history of the origin. So it fits well being Genesis. It fits well being Bereshit or Genesis from the Greek. And if I said that wrong, for all you Greek scholars, forgive me. <laughs> um, but the book is well named because we're going to look at the beginning or the origin of the universe of order and complexity. And what I mean by that, we're going to look at the programmer and his program. We'll find the beginning of the solar system. We'll find the beginning of the atmosphere and the hydrosphere. That's never found on other planets, and that's necessary for life, life as we know it. And we will find the origin of life, the origin of man, the origin of marriage, and fortunately, the origin of evil. We'll find the origin of language, the beginning of government, the beginning of culture, of nations, the beginning of religion, learning about relationship too. And we even will find the beginning of the chosen people. These are God's channel, his people that he chose. We'll call them the people of the word, the word of God. 
and the Savior of the world is going to come through this line of people that we will get the beginning of in Genesis. So what's the purpose of all of this? Is it just to fill us with a lot of facts, or is there purpose? And of course we know there's purpose. It's to reveal to man the foundational truths upon which God's plan and his purpose for man can be built. So if you're going to build a house, you want to lay down a strong foundation. The foundation for the house that we're going to be building, and I'm going to call it a spiritual house because we want to build in relation to our God, the foundation, we will get a good solid foundation from the book of Genesis. We're going to find that it reveals the beginning of the creation of the world, of man, of animal life. It's going to tell of man's fall, but most importantly, we'll learn from Genesis of the salvation that's been planned by God before the foundations of this world. And that there is a, and I should say, an ability for man to have that self-revelation, sorry, that self-revelation of a relationship with God because God put that into us to have that ability to connect with him. I'm thrilled for that. There are eight covenants in scripture that God made with man. Four of them are in the book of Genesis. They're the, and we'll go over them as we come to them, but they're the Edenic, E-D-E-N-I-C, that means the Garden of Eden, Adamic, the covenant God made with Adam, the Noah, which God made with Noah, and the Avrahamic, which God made with Avraham, or with Abraham. These are the four that we will find in Genesis. We'll find that the roots of Revelation are found in Genesis. It's the original birthplace of all theology, we find the germ, the seed, the, the form, the type for almost all of the great doctrines that we believe in from Scripture, developed through Scripture, get their roots in Genesis. Doctrines like the Trinity. How do we know that there is a Trinity? Well, Genesis 1, 1 and 2 will introduce us right away to the Trinity. We will see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We'll see those three are one, though, and we'll get that from our first Hebrew lesson. You won't always get all Hebrew, but when we hit those first words, we get it all in Hebrew. We'll find the creation and the fall of man in chapters 2 and 3. We have the doctrine of knowing that Satan, Satan, is the arch enemy of, well, of our God, of Elohim, of the one true and living God of Israel, Chapter 3 will introduce us to that fact. We'll learn about God's election from Avraham, Abraham, chapter 12, from Yitzhak, Isaac, chapter 26, from Yaakov, Jacob, chapter 28. So there will be a long time before we get to visit with Jacob, but we'll get there. We'll learn about salvation by the shed blood as early as chapter 3, verse 21, if you want a verse. We'll learn about justification by faith. That's in chapter 15 and verse 6. We'll even see a picture of the rapture in Genesis. Anyone know whose character shows us that picture? Say that again, the rapture. We get a picture of the rapture in Genesis. One of the Bible characters. Enoch. Say it again. Enoch. 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 Very good. Enoch in chapter 5 and verse 24. And when we get there, we'll explain that. We'll see a picture of the tribulation. Now notice I said a picture. It's not the timing, but it's the picture in chapters 6 through 8. And we even see a picture of the millennial kingdom in chapter 12, verse 3, in chapter 22 and verse 18, chapter 49 and verse 10. Um, don't worry, we'll go through all of these in detail. But if I stop and teach them all to you today, well, I couldn't even get through them today. We'd have the whole book of Genesis. <laughs> We'll learn about the separation of believers from the world and the world judgment that follows when we look at Lot, Lot, as I say, and Sodom, Sodom, in chapter 19. We learn about intercessory prayer. That's very clear in chapter 20 and verse 17, but we can actually see it also in chapter 18, verses 22 and 23, when we have Abraham in relation, Abraham in relation to Sodom. We learn about the incarnation, the virgin birth. We learn about that in chapter 3 and verse 15. We get a lot of doctrine early in Genesis. 
Uh, we learn about the death and the resurrection of the Son, and I say capital S-O-N, the Son, in chapter 22. And we learn about the priesthood of Mashiach, of our Messiah, of our Savior, that is after the order of one called Melchizedek, Melchizedek in Hebrew. We learn about that in chapter 14, verses 18 to 24. And I put down in your cross-references, if you want to study him a little bit and get an idea of who he is, you'll see him in Psalm 110, verse 4, and Hebrews 6.20. But the groundwork is in Bereshit, it's in Genesis. The beginning of the Babylonian mystery religion started by, or at the time of Nimrod, in chapter 10, verses 8 to 10, and chapter 11 of Genesis, follows this all the way through. We see it, unfortunately, alive and well in Revelation, but we get it, it being revealed at its beginning in Genesis. We learn about the land given to Israel. Gotta say that. Not given to the Palestinians, given to Israel. Sorry, but that's who I am, and it's God's word. It's not me anyway. In chapter 12 and verse 7, and chapter 13 and verse 15, we'll see that is land given to Israel. And we'll see the divine judgment given to us in picture form with the flood in chapter 6, with Sodom in chapter 19, and other times also. So a lot of our doctrines from the Trinity to salvation to judgment to what's coming in the future, rapture, all the way through tribulation, the millennial kingdom, all of this we get in Genesis. Do you see why we're going to have to be here for a long time? <laughs> but do you also see why it's a very good place to start? Really, if you want to understand the rest of Scripture, you need to have a basic, good foundation from the book of Genesis. It helps un unveil a lot as we go along the line. The importance of the book, well, if I tell you it's the most quoted book in other biblical books, I think you'd have to agree with me. That's reason to say, okay, then God must see this as very important. We have at least 165 passages in Genesis that are quoted either directly or referred to in the Brachadashah, in the New Testament. And many are alluded to more than once, so we really have at least 200 quotes or allusions to the book of Genesis by the time we get through with the Brachadashah. So that's a lot of, uh, if the, the New Testament is drawing continually from Genesis, to me it's like going into a college level class of mathematics and you're drawing back on that kindergarten, first grade level of addition and subtraction and, and growing up through multiplication and division. But you need each of those to be able to handle what's coming. Apart from Genesis, from the book, you would have no explanation for Israel. This nation is an enigma. How do you take a people out of their land almost 2,000 years and they stayed a people? That's a miracle. That's God. That's explained as we see God's relationship and his promises in the book of Genesis. But honestly, apart from Genesis, apart from God, you'd have to scratch your head and wonder how that little country lives another day. The historicity of Genesis. Do we take this as historical fact? Do we take it as allegory? Do we believe it's a myth? Because that's what's taught. All three are taught. Some teach Genesis as fact, history. Some teach it as allegory. You're supposed to draw lessons and learn for it, from it and apply it. And some say it is a flat-out myth, no better than Aesop's fables. Where do we stand? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%, fundamentally, without apology, fact, history, truth. This is the very word of God, and it's given to us and placed in the position of, I believe, importance. Get your foundation. Move on. Don't leave it behind, though. If the first Adam that we read about is allegory, then our second Adam would be allegory. Why would that matter? Who's our second Adam? Let me take you, because I want some scripture today, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 to 50. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 50. 
Thank you. My tablet finally decided to cooperate. Okay. Here we read, so also it is written, the first man, Adam, so no question who the first man is, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. Of course, we're going to go and study that in depth when we get into Genesis. The last Adam, or the second Adam, became a life-giving spirit. Okay, so who can give life? Who's the one that gives the life-giving spirit? We know that to be only God himself when he's being referred to as the second man or the last man, then obviously we are seeing a reference to our God in deity being fully God, able to give life, but he's fully man. So we see that develop right here also. And this is critically important because it's man that is in need of the second man, of this final one. If man didn't fall into sin, he wouldn't need a savior. If evolution was true and we all just evolved, then there's no future consummation of things to come that we need to worry about. We don't need the Savior. If Genesis isn't true, then the testimony of the prophets and the apostles who believed it was true and who quoted from it, we've got to throw their words out also. Because I, for one, am not going to give you the opportunity to pick and choose. This is truth and this is false. This is true and this is an allegory. This is true and that's just a myth. Just throw it out. No. You either are going to take the entire word of God as the word of God and believe it wholly to be the word of God. Or you might as well put it on the level of the fables and throw it out as far as banking your life on it, studying it, looking for answers, and for knowing where you'll end up if you have more than evolved, if you've been created indeed as Genesis tells us. If Genesis is not true, one of those that, that we're going to call out as false then is the very Messiah and Savior, Yeshua Jesus himself because he would then be a false witness. He would then be a deceiver or deceived himself. He would be a blasphemer concerning his divinity because we get his divinity right from the beginning. We've already talked a bit about that. And that would mean that faith in the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah, for salvation becomes meaningless. It, in fact, really, more than that, it's, it's a mockery. If it's not truth, it really is. But I'll give you no room for that. I find nothing in Genesis that's impossible to believe. Does it mean we understand it? <laughs> no. But just because you don't understand something, does that make it false? Well, if that were true, then... Let's get rid of all of our scientists and all our brainiacs and all of their inventions and all the rest because we little peons take advantage of what we don't understand. But aren't we thankful for their wisdom? And again, as we look at the book of Genesis, we're going to see there is nothing that gives room for it to not be anything but 100% truth. 100% the Word of God revealing to man what man needs to know. And that's what we get from the very beginning. And we'll go through it. We'll go through in our background a lot some of the arguments that come against Genesis. But again, when we're done, I think that you'll realize that it would take more faith to believe in an evolution and a process than it would be to believe in it, thus saith the Lord God. Who's our author? Of course, Overall, our author is God. We know that. But who, humanly spoken of, do we give credit to writing the book of Bereshit of Genesis? Usually, it is given credit to Moshe. But I'm going to introduce you to the fact that I believe Moshe was, yes, the author, but I believe he was a compiler also. What does that mean? Well, that means that, I, uh, and I'll show you why we believe it, that there were books that were written, maybe I shouldn't use the word book. Let me, let me use scrolls because we know they wrote on scrolls. 
there were scrolls that were written. There was written documentary given that I believe was given to Moshe for him to put together his comments in between, making it a smooth transition. He adding in his also, and he overall, because he compiled it, put it all together, added on, finished it off, is the, the one given sole authority. But we'll see that I don't believe he did it all totally alone. If you do when we're, we're done with this, that's fine. I have no problem with that either. Neither one can be 100%. It has to be this way. But ultimately, we know either God revealed it to Moshe the same way that he revealed to any other writer of any other book in the Bible, or we know that he worked through a number of people bringing it all together either way. The, the ultimate is still God is the author. The objection to Moshe from the critics is that writing wasn't known in Moshe's day. Really? Not true. Really? You give archaeology long enough, you give those students of history long enough, and it'll prove the Bible right every time. Somebody said, turn a spade, turn a page in the Bible, and that's about what you would get. There are excavations now in Egypt, in the area of Mesopotamia also, that have proven that writing was practiced widely and in many forms long before the time of Moshe. Because Moshe, we are, we're coming down, the Exodus was about 1400 BC, 1400 to 1450 BC. So we have to go back a number, a couple hundred years, we're going back to people that lived before Moshe. But we'll get into all of that. We'll show that. The scripture that gives us evidence that Moshe wrote, and I take the scripture again as sole authority, the scripture that says Moshe wrote, let's look at a few of those. Shemot is the first, that's Exodus. And we're going to look at Exodus chapter 17 and verse 14. Exodus 17 and verse 14, we read, then the Lord, Adonai, said to Moshe, to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Yeshua. And then he goes on from there. Okay? Why would God tell Moses to write if he couldn't write? I certainly would not take Rowena's precious little, what, how old is Nathan? Six months now? Five months, six months old? Oh, he's just four months, four, almost five. Okay. I wouldn't take that little precious Nathan or Betty's precious grandson, Nathan also, great grandson. And I wouldn't put a pen in either one of their hands and say, write. That would be ridiculous. But if God is telling Moshe to write, then he had the ability. Obviously, it wasn't an ink pen of today, but he had what they used of that day. He was able to write or God would not have phrased it that way. Maybe God would have said, pass it down, retell, narrate, but he uses the word for write. Chapter 24. <clears throat> chapter 24, same book, Shemot or Exodus, chapter 24, starting with verse 4. Moses, Moshe, wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he rose early in the morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel. They offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood, put it in the basin, the other half he sprinkled on the altar. Then, verse 7, he took the book of the covenant and read it. That sounds like writing to me. Sounds like there's something written down. He read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. So obviously, what did Moshe read? The recorded words of the Lord. We'll see that also, or we won't now, but I'll let you look up um, chapter 34, verses 27 and 28. And then you can go to another book, Bud Midbar, Numbers, Bud Midbar is the Hebrew, chapter 33, and verses 1 and 2. Now, when we get into the New Covenant, we get into the British Kodeshah, the New Testament, we get into chapter 15 of the book of Acts, and we have Acts 15.1 refer to the circumcision. The way it refers to it is as the custom taught by Moses. Now, they, you could argue and say, well, it was passed down, but when we already know Moses wrote, then we know even circumcision carried on in the time of the Acts, carried on even in this day by those who are religiously uh, practicing Judaism, 
we see it dates back to Moshe, who wrote it down. Um, Yeshua, Jesus, his testimony. Let's, let's look at those. Let's look at Mark 10. Because again, either everything he says is trustworthy or I throw it all out. I don't get to pick and choose and I'm not going to leave it up to anyone else because who would get to say this is true and this is false? You know, it, it's all or it's nothing. Mark 10, verse 3, we read, <clears throat> okay, that's got, he answered and said to them, I've got to get you into who. Verse 2 tells us the Pharisees, Parashim, that come to Yeshua, Jesus, they're testing him. They want to catch him in a trap. So they're, they're trying to get something out of him that way. And he answers in verse 3, but how he answers, he says to them, what did Moshe, Moses, command you? They said, and this is their own words now. Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Well, that tells me now that it wasn't just Moshe alone who knew how to write in his day, but the people knew how to write. And they wrote down rules and regulations to live by. I think we call that the laws of the land or of the city, of the community, you know, the nation, whatever you want to call it. So obviously we're seeing here that Yeshua is giving Moses credit for being the one who's written. And even the people are saying, well, this is what Moses' writing said. And, and it records that the people wrote. Um, and if you want to know what it is, it's that bill of divorcement. Um, that Yeshua Jesus makes it clear it was only because of the hardness of their heart that that came into being a doctrine. That was not something that was God's first choice for mankind. Look at Yochanan. Look at John chapter 5, verses 46 and 47. John 5, 46 and 47. And we read there, For if you believe Moshe, this is Yeshua Jesus speaking again, excuse me, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Mm. But if you did not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Obviously, writings and words are two different. Words are coming out of the mouth of writing is what has recorded it and what has been set down there. So we do have plenty of evidence internally even, that writing was taking place during Moshe's day, and then we have the outer excavations, archaeology, that proves it also, um, tablets and so forth that have been discovered. So how did Moshe write Genesis? What method? A, received by direct revelation from God. B, <laughs> received by oral traditions passed down over the centuries from father to son. C, took actual written records of the past, collected them all, brought them together in a final form, all guided by the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Well, remember I told you that we're looking at um, 15th century B.C. I'm sorry? A. A? You're going A, you're going to receive by direct revelation. Well, we'll never yes. argue that point, but how did it, how was it just by direct revelation or was it by taking written records, collecting them, bringing them together, putting them into a final form, all under the direction of that direct revelation from God by the Holy Spirit? All of the above. I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and actually, C is what we're really looking at because I will show you and let me give you to you just in, in an overall view right now, but then we'll see this time and time again as we study it. But if we lay down the foundation now, then we'll just hit on it at that point. There's a word in Hebrew, it's called toldot, T-O-L-D-O-T. So you could do told and then you could do ought, but it's told dot, okay? It's not told, it's told dot. Told dot in Hebrew is generations, okay? Um, I think in the New American Standard, it gives it the word account, O-C-C-O-U-N-T. He gave an account of his actions. That would be the same idea, okay? Is that the answer for C? Yes, okay. it fits with C. 
And what it means is it can be translated history, it can be translated chronology, which is time. If it means history or if it means chronological events, then what we could be seeing is that someone has written at the end of their writing, like when you write a letter and you sign your name, at the end of what they had written, this would be their signature, meaning that everything prior to that, they're, they're taking credit for. Why do we sign letters? Well, you need to sign letters because people need to know who they're coming from. <laughs> but if you're doing it right in front of someone, you still sign it as a, a way of saying, I declare this is from me. I'm the one who, who wrote this. I'm the one who spoke these words, and they are now written. So if, that, if what is being meant by the Toldot is giving credit for each of those sections by the one who has written it, then what we're going to see as we go down, I don't want to give you so much Hebrew I confuse you, but I, I think that you would be good with this. What we see in several places, and I'll show you a couple of examples in a moment, what we see is, and I'll put the word in front of it, Safer, S-E-F-E-R, then we see Toldot, and then we'll see a name. Okay, let's take the first one, and this is an easy one for us. Let's take Adam. Okay, Adam. So, we're going to see that we've studied a number of places. In fact, let me take you to it because it might be easier to see it uh, than just hear it. Go to Genesis 2 with me real quickly. It'll be a while before we're there verse by verse like we will do. But Genesis 2 and verse 4 tells us this is the account. This is the total. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created and the day the Lord God made earth and heaven. Okay? So we're getting an account. This account's going to be given. Now, go with me to chapter 5 and verse 1. Okay, so I'm talking about everything from 2-4 to 5-1. Okay? 5-1 says, this is the book. This is the safer. Okay? Safer. This is the book of the generations told out of Adam. Adam. So if you saw the first three words here, you would see safer told out Adam. That's how you would see it in the Hebrew. Basically, what it sounds like, if we're understanding it right, is it's saying everything I've written from the, the, where I told you, here's the count of how it goes in chapter 2 and verse 4, all the way to chapter 5 and verse 1, I, Adam, am the one who kept this account. And then we're going to see that for Noah. We're going to see it for others as we move down. There's a number of times. In fact, it, it's Adam, it's Noah, it's Shem, it's Terah, it's Yitzhak, it's Yaakov, Isaac and Jacob. It's at least those. If I didn't miss anybody besides coming down the point of Moses. That would give us indication that fits with that, that each wrote records of what took place during their lifetime that they're keeping account of, and they kept a good record of it, and they passed that record on. Okay, we do that today. We keep family records, and we pass them down. Some do better than others. Some don't do anything at all. But you understand what I'm saying. So, the history, the generations of the heavens and the earth started in 2-4. What about before 2-4? Well, was anybody around when God created the heavens and the earth as we know it, as recorded up through chapter 2 and verse 3? So, would that be why there's not a safer todot and a human name? Because prior to that is what absolutely was given by direct revelation by God to Moshe, who did not live during it. He could have had the stories passed down, but I believe God absolutely was seeing to it that every word was divinely inspired. Every word was written accurately. Every word was complete to give us everything. So what was written about how the heavens and the earth, the form, and all that that we'll study was direct revelation from God. Then when you have Adam living, Adam wrote 
If Moshe could write and they didn't think so, why do you think God created Adam not with the ability to write? Really? Really? That's kind of like saying, oh yeah, we got cavemen. You know, they, they carry clubs and grab the women by the hair and, and finally invented the square wheel to a round wheel and went, mm, good. <laughs> and we know that's a fallacy. I believe God overall saw to the compilation of each, but I believe that Adam wrote his part and then his son wrote part and Noah wrote part because what better than the eyewitness to write the records? Of course, God can supersede anything. We know that. And we know especially the prophets writing what they didn't understand and foretelling, writing what hasn't come yet. It had to been by direct revelation from God, not something that they lived through. Not every book is recording your history, but Genesis does record the history of Adam, the history of Isaac, the history of who else they named Noah, you know. So I believe that we can see that from Scripture. So we have no author in the beginning except God he himself. Then we have the generations or the history, the Toldot of Adam. Um, and indicating calling it a book also gives you the indication that it's a written record. And the word safer does come with all that in plural form, it's suffering. If I called someone today in my Jewish world, I said, he's the sofer, you all would look at me like, okay, what's she saying? But to those who know Hebrew, the sofer is the one that's writing the, the scriptures even today. The scribes that we talk about in scripture were called sofer, sofarim if they're plural. Okay, so very close to sefer. In, and remember again, the vowels are not in Hebrew. It's what we put in English. But I would spell it with an O just to, so that you hear a bit of a difference. Sofer is the scribe. Sefer is the book the scribe wrote. When I was in Israel this last time, I had the privilege of meeting a sofer mm. for Rabbi Yitzhak Naki, the one that, that um, does all the humanitarian work for the, the poor in Jerusalem. He's teaching, he has a yeshiva, it's called a school, yeshiva is the Hebrew word, and he's teaching rabbis in training. And they have on site a sofer, a scribe. He took Brenda's name, he took Brianna, her daughter who was with us, and he took my name and went to another room and came back with them written in perfect Hebrew, beautiful Hebrew. I should have brought it. Yes. It's one of my favorite, I can't call it a souvenir, one of my favorite treasures from, Hebrew, from Israel, just because of how I got it and where it came from. But I say that for you to understand, this is still a word today, this is still the person. The sofer is the scribe who writes the books. The books that he's writing are the original covenant. He's writing somewhere in the... The, what they call the Jewish scriptures. We know the whole Bible is the Jewish scriptures, but we're talking about what you call the old, but we call it original because we don't want you to think old, antiquated, done. So we call it original, trying to help. Um, other words that are similar. So fruit is literature. So is the library. It all fits. Keeping that in your mind, go to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Mm. And again, I did not, and I I love people, I understand, but I don't like everything they say. I did not just leave the Jewish scriptures when I went, took you to Matthew. How can you leave the Jewish scriptures when you're going to read a Jewish genealogy from verse 1 forward? It's still Jewish. It is so Jewish that it starts out and it says, this is the genealogy of Yeshua, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I don't think you get much more Jewish than that, people. <laughs> so we're still in the Jewish scriptures. But notice, it's the record of the genealogy. I could say the account of the genealogy, the same way that we took that back in Genesis. That's why I believe that we're seeing the recorded accounts of those who wrote the books, and when they signed their name on it, it was their part. And then it's passed on to the next generation, so to speak, and the next generation. And by the time we come to the 15th century B.C. and we come to Moshe, Moses, who was 
held up in high esteem in a sense as a redeemer. Notice I didn't say the redeemer, but a redeemer of the children of Israel. We know God raised up a deliverer, sent him in to get the children of Israel out of Egypt. And God used him all the way up to their time to go into the promised land through their 40 years of wandering. He is their spiritual leader. He has great uh, respect and uh, what's the word I want? Um, he's to be revered. He was one who was telling the people what God wanted them to hear. He was writing it down, but it wasn't the days of the printing press. He didn't write it at home, put it into the computer, hit the print button, and bring you all a copy like I did today for cross-references. So he would speak it, he would read it to them, he was hearing it from the Lord, and the Lord guided him via the Baruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, the same as we say for every book written in the Bible, that God was in control of what the men wrote, inspired them what to write, and then um, gave us a complete, perfect edition. Okay? So, we're going to give Moshe Moses the overall credit, but we're going to look at the fact that it looks like he he compiled from others also. Again, though, they would have written by God's direction with them also. Um, just to give you some ideas again, I brought you through the history of Noah. Noah's father, Lamech, lived contemporaneously with every one of the patriarchs, including Adam. You know, I, I don't know if you have the same problem I have, but I tend, because of learning about Bible people, when I was very little, I tend to compartmentalize. Here's Adam in the box. Here's Noah in a box. Here's Abraham in a box. And I don't realize some of these people had their lives overlapping. And if you look at a timeline, it really surprises me, but I totally understand and I need to think this way more often. Noah's daddy knew Adam, <laughs> okay? There is a close relationship there. That, well, I, I'm not saying they were close, but I mean in age, you know, that there was that relation there. Noah himself would know all except Adam, Seth, and Enoch. They had passed away by the time Noah is on the scene, but he would have known all the others that followed him. Then the history, the generations of the sons of Noah that we pick up from chapter 6, verse 9 to chapter 10, that records the preparation for the flood, the flood itself, and the events immediately following the flood. Who better to author that than Noah's sons who lived through it? Okay? Noah's prophecy and his death are included, so even if Noah wrote up to it, his sons had to finish that part off because I don't think Noah could write when he died. <laughs> <laughs> but his son certainly could. Then we pick up in chapter 10, verse 1, and again, each time we come to these, I'll, I'll teach, I'll remind us about it. Through 11, chapter 10, uh, sorry, chapter 11, verse 10, we read about Shem, and that Shem, the oldest son of Noah, probably took on the responsibility of keeping the records because he's the one recorded there in chapter 11, and verse 10, and he lived 500 years after the flood. That's a long time. So he'd have a lot of history to be telling. This would be a lot that, that Moses would have been taught from these accounts. And of course, God sing to it again, that it, it was kept perfectly. We keep going down from 1110, we go to 1127, and we have the generations, the history, the Toldot of Torah, who was the father of Abraham. He gives just a very brief but an important chronology to keep that timeline going. Then we come into the history and the generations of Yitzhak from 1127 to 2519, and that tells all about Avraham's life. It tells about Yitzhak's until his father died. And apparently um, Yitzhak probably appended the, the records when he met Ishmael again. Remember, Ishmael was sent off. Hagar and Ishmael went off. But in chapter 25 and verse 12 of Genesis, we read that the two sons, Ishmael and Yitzhak, Isaac, buried their father, Avraham. Probably at that time when they were reunited, Ishmael would have introduced Yitzhak to his family. It would think about it today. Two brothers, that, that half-brothers, albeit, but they haven't seen each other in years. They would, you know, the question would be asked, 
who are these? Oh, this is my son, this is my grandson. You know, you would introduce. And apparently um, Yitzhak took the records of the genealogy of Ishmael and included them. That, and I'm sorry, it's 25 verse 9 where they buried them. Okay, where, where they buried Abraham. But the generations of Ishmael, given in this format to look like Ishmael had a part in saying who was in his, his um, family line, is in 2512. Then we go further from 2519, we go to th chapter 37, and we have the generations of Yaakov. We have Jacob. And just as um, Yitzhak was able to get Ishmael's records, Yaakov also included two documents from his brother Esau. Because remember, Esau also went off. One second. Chapter 36, after his, he joined his brother in bearing their father, he would have gotten the information from Ishmael at that time to include in his accounts. Yes. Teacher, where are we? <laughs> are we Genesis? Are we yes, what? we're doing. We're, we're doing. For, for all fairness to her, she just came into class a few minutes ago. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I thought I mean, you. I didn't know whether we're Genesis or, or Matthew. But let's do Matthew over here. Because and you don't even get the text message that said we're starting in the very beginning, a very good place to start, which has made Julie <laughs> sing the song all day. <laughs> I'd sing it for you, but I'd ruin it. <laughs> We're studying Genesis. We're going back to what we left off with when COVID hit. We're picking it back up, so we're all the way back at the beginning. Okay? So, yes, we're studying an overview right now of the book of Genesis that, that lays the foundation for the rest of the Word of God. Okay, so I've gotten you all the way through chapter 35. Um, in chapter 36, we get Moshe, being the author at this point, writing about kings. He, we know that there were kings mentioned in Genesis 17, in verses 6 and uh, 16. But there are those, again, who are critics of Moshe, who say, you know, that he can't be the author because he talks about future kings. No. God can tell them prophetically what to write, and kings were not unheard of because we have them all the way back many chapters earlier. So just because Moshe refers to a time that Israel's going to have a king doesn't mean that somebody else had to have written it, that, that it, we can't give Moses credit for it because God revealed. He revealed to the prophets all along what was coming. Daniel, Daniel, one of the greatest prophets, we still don't have the end of his prophecy. It's still prophetic. It's still looking for it. Chapter 11 goes into that future, goes to the Battle of Armageddon and beyond. But earlier in chapter 11, the, the battle took place, I should have looked up my facts. Um, I want to say 5th century B.C., uh, no, Daniel wrote 5th century B.C. Okay, anyway, what my point is, because I can't remember the time right now, and I can look that up for you, but the critics said, oh, Daniel could not have written this in the, first cent in the 5th century B.C. because he gave specifics to how that war went. And it didn't happen, I think, okay, I think it's in the 2nd century when it happened. And so they tried to say, oh, he had to, somebody else had to have written this because... Daniel couldn't have known those facts. It would be like me telling you something that's going to happen a couple hundred years from now and giving you exact specifics of how it's going to happen. Well, they tried to throw Daniel out and say, see, you know, the, this can't be trusted. It's not true. You shouldn't have credit for it. And then they found documents that they knew dated back to the 5th century B.C. that recorded what Daniel had said. They couldn't argue with that, that these documents were written in that century, and the battle didn't happen for a couple hundred years. But God told Daniel how it was going to go. We can do that right now. You all want to be prophetic? <laughs> Read the book of Revelation and tell people in detail what's going to happen at the Battle of Armageddon. And if you stay with Scripture, you'll be right on target. It's still coming. God knows. He sees it all. It's done in His mind. <laughs> So this is no problem for us. Um, actually, we believe easily, too, that, that Moshe, even though he would have gathered from these others, it was he that continued to write in Exodus and on down through the line. That, that's why he gets the credit for really writing all the way through the Torah, the five books, and no problem with that. 
Um, but again, he probably had these records. They kept the records safe, and when they came out of Egypt, he would have been the natural one to have been in charge of them and to, to protect them, and that would have given him all that information. And then being divinely inspired by God, we get the, the smooth transition that we read today. That gives room for why you'll see for those who are scholars in Hebrew and that sort of thing, they'll see little differences in the phrasing of something or the um, word that's given for God. Well, if you've got different people writing it, they write with their styles. The way Sha'al Paul wrote was different than the way Kepha Peter wrote. But we, we see and understand that because those two, those books have their names on it. Well, again, if Moshe was compiling some of the records of what these people wrote, then it would have been in their language, in their style, and in, in, in their way. So um, a lot of times it just allows itself to be self-explanatory. And archaeology agrees with all this because, again, we have found the, the, um, the sources that, that uh, relate to what Genesis teaches us. And it being quoted in the New Testament, too, is my way of saying God's obviously given his stamp of approval on all of it. The Lord himself quoting from it, he wouldn't have quoted from something that he did not feel was accurate. He wouldn't, he wouldn't use something that was wrong. With all that in mind, we'll put the dating of Genesis at about 1450 to 1410 B.C., that's about the time. Believe it or not, I haven't given you the background yet. <laughs> Let me give you the background for Genesis in general, okay? Chapters 1 through 38. That's why I say in general. I'm not going chapter 1, chapter 2. We'll go through everything verse by verse. But 1 through 38 give a view of ancient Mesopotamian life and culture. It tells us the geography of the time. It tells us the map making, the construction techniques, the migrations of peoples, the sales and purchases of land, legal customs and practices, procedures of the time. We see shepherding. We see cattle raising. All of this and more is all recorded, and that's all life of man in general. We get a good picture of what life was like back in those early years. And the people will, will be introduced to were interested in those types of things for their living, for their patterns, for their ways. We're going to be introduced to individuals. We're going to be introduced to families. We're going to be introduced to tribes. And actually, more than half of the people that are listed in our Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11, come out of the book of Genesis. I think that gives a vital importance to their lives, but what I want you to see and my intent to do in the study of the book of Genesis is to make these real people to you all. They're real. They lived. They breathed. They sat down and ate lunch. They had to go to sleep at night, too. They had to get up and get dressed. They had chores to do. They had places they had to go. They traveled. We think travel's just in our day. They didn't jet, obviously, but they traveled, and we'll see they traveled as we study. We're going to see life began in Eden. That was humanity's first home, was Eden. Located near Mesopotamia, where the Tower of Babel was also built, where Avram, Abram, was born, where Yitzhak's wife came from, and where Yaakov, Jacob, lived for 20 years. This was a bustling metropolis. This was an area of life, and I want us to see that. I don't want it to be dead people. These are people who were alive. They're still alive in one form. Well, not in one form or another. I can't say that, but, but the believing ones we know are in a good place. I'll put it that way. But they were, they were real people, and I want us to see that. The original homeland was the Mesopotamia area until it's moved to Canaan, Canaan, the land that God promised to Israel. We're going to find ancient literature parallels the book of Genesis, that uh, we have an introduction to the gods like Marduk in Babylonian pantheism with all of their gods. This was one of their main ones. And we have tablets found that tell similar stories to the creation, to the rebellion, to the flood. We find clay tablets dating 2500 to 2300 BC at the site of Elba. Elba was uh, in northern Syria. These, these tablets that were found aren't considered inerrant like the Word of God, but they're considered great history books that teach the history, that teach the, the Babylonian gods that they were 
worshiping, and so forth and so on. Other documents name our patriarchs, like Job. He is also found in the Mari letters and the Nuzi tablets, N-U-Z-I, not Nuzi, N-E-W-S-Y, <laughs> but Nuzi tablets that found how they were relating to life in those days. Here's, here's where we get some of those stories about their travel. We learned their customs, the inheritance rights, how those adopted in the household were considered, whether they were a member, whether they were a slave. What was the obligation of a barren wife to furnish her husband with sons through a servant girl? Hmm, does that give us a little insight to a couple of stories that are popping out in your mind right now? Abraham being one of them. Interesting, isn't it? We're going to learn all kinds of uh, the, the authority, the, the laws, the regulations, even the deathbed rape bequests in Near Eastern law. They call that area the Near East, okay? And that's all going to serve to remind us again, real people living real lives according to traditions, according to laws, according to preferences, and we're going to see the sovereign hand of God all the way through. He graciously intrudes, if you want to call it that, into the lives of the people that we're reading about. We see the law of the firstborn. And we see that very clearly in Jewish tradition, laid down. But guess what? God interrupts that. We, he interrupts it time and again. We have him interrupted in the beginning with Seth over King. Set over Kion, if you want their Hebrew names. We see it of Shem over Japheth, Noah's sense. We see it where we do know it and remember it, of Yitzhak over Ishmael, of Jacob over Esau, Judah and Joseph over some of their other brothers, and Ephraim over Manasseh. Gave you the names in English to make it easier right now. These people that were people of God we're not just the product of human reproduction and do whatever they want. This is God involved in those lives and in the development of what he is channeling through because he had a purpose. He had every intention from the start of a relationship with this race called human, of being involved in humanity, of consecrating um, do I say consecrating himself? We concentrate, consecrate ourselves to God, so I'm thinking I'm saying that a little backwards, but let me put it this way. He intended to enter into people's lives, to, into the destiny of what was going on in the people, of working through a specific people to bring himself into that race called the Jewish race to be the redeemer, the kinsman redeemer, but to be the redeemer for the world. This was the channel that he was choosing to go through and why he even said, to Avram, in you all the world will be blessed. How are all the nations blessed through Avram? Well, when you know his seed, eventually as Yeshua Jesus, there's your blessing to the world. So, again, this book is very foundational, very important for understanding the rest of the Bible. I love Dr. McGee, and he was a long time with the Lord. He was alive and taught my mom when she was in college, but he said that in Genesis, you have Grand Central Station. I think this is a good way to put it. When you go to Grand Central Station, that's the main hub. All the trains are going out. They're all going out in different directions, different times, going to different locations. Many of the subjects, probably about everything, and the themes are seen in the first three chapters of Genesis. We've got Grand Central Station, and we've got all these trains going out. And guess what? When they come back home, it's the last three chapters of the book of Revelation. Everything in between is those trains out there on those tracks. Lay down the foundation, see the completion, and everything in between will help you understand. Nice so, analogy. It is, isn't it? It is a great yeah. way to put it, put it and look at it. So we see the importance and why I'm even taking a whole class to lay down the foundation of the background, to give you the introduction. Because if we just jump in... We'll have a good study, but we're going to glean so much more all the way through this study because of this class today. And do I expect you to remember it all? Only if you got a better mind than I do, and I hope you do, but I'll bring it out again and again so you don't have to worry because I learned by repetitiveness. 
Uh, the numbers and their significance are seen in Scripture also. This isn't something that I can say y'all have to believe and this is exactly it, but I think it's interesting because I see the many levels that God works on, teaches us on. I see one Scripture mean more than just one meaning you know we take the literal meaning but there can be so much more than just the literal meaning it's like going to a well and you can take your spoon and dip your spoon in and get a, a swallow of water and it's good and it's refreshing but you can take a cup and bring that up and get a good drink or you can put a bucket down oh, and bring yes, it up please. i'm sorry yes please yes please <laughs> and we can get saturated pour it over our heads lord let it soak into every nook and cranny. That's what we want to do. We want to see the depth of the Word of God, and that's what tells me it's the Word of God, because you can read it a hundred times and a hundred and first time because you've grown or you've learned something or God's able, for some reason, to be able to reveal something new to you. You can go, wow, that's been there all the time. How did I not see that? But that's our God, and that's His Word. And some of the things that are just interesting are the things that ten times is going to be recorded. God said... Let there be. We're going to see it ten times. I'll rattle off where. Genesis 1, 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 24, 26, and 30. So they're all in the first chapter of Genesis. Some term that the Ten Commandments of Creation. Just an interesting way to put it. When you know that ten's regarded as a complete number in Scripture, now you have a complete picture of creation. Just interesting. In Hebrew, there are just seven words in the opening verse, verse 1. That's composed of 28 Hebrew letters. Okay? Seven times four is 28. This is the way some people like to play with numbers. I'm not saying you have to, but it's interesting. Because seven is the number of perfection. Four is the number for earth, which fits with creation in Scripture, and that comes together. Seven being completion, perfection, and four being the earth, how God created. And it's just an interesting way to look at it. We're going to see there are seven perfect or distinct stages in God's work. Of, and I'm going to throw you for a loop and you have to come back in the future to understand this. The restoring of the earth. Hmm. She said restoring. She didn't say creating. <laughs> hmm. What's she hinting at? Ooh, we got a big discussion coming on that one later. In this perfect restoration that I'm just going to say and just call out right now and explain as we go into it later, we're going to see the activity of the Holy Spirit, verse 2. We're going to see light called into existence in verse 3, the making of the firmament in verses 6 to 9, the clothing of the earth with vegetation in verse 11, making and arranging the heavenly bodies, verses 14 to 18, <clears throat> the storing of the waters, 20 and 21, and the stocking the earth with animals, etc., because we'll get to human life also in verse 24. Seven perfectly distinct stages, all to restore this earth so that we have life as we have it. What hits me as interesting is when you look at the evolutionary processes, and I will bring out a quote that I read just in this past week that blew me away. I don't think I have it with me. I'm looking to see because I didn't know I was going to bring it out today. I don't have it with me. I can't do it justice, but it tells you there's like 30 different things that have to come into order in relation to each other to have an earth and a creation and everything that we have and the probability of it happening on any other on a, on a planet is so astronomical in number that you run out of planets that we know in this universe and I don't mean nine that we know we're talking billions but you you run out of planets before you run out of opportunity for it to happen again somewhere else but God brought this all together it's fascinating. I'll give you a lot of creation, blow your mind facts that if I don't have it right in front of me, I, I can't retain it well, repeat it well, because it just blows my mind. But uh, we'll also see typology. Typology is where we see that God's teaching us spiritual lessons, giving us pictures that something is a type of. 
Um, like I said, the, the flood being a type of judgment, you know, that we saw that Enoch being a type of the rapture. That's typology in scripture. And we're going to see that the early history of this earth corresponds with the spiritual history of mankind and of the believer in Yeshua, in his Savior. The original earth, I believe, was perfect. Notice I've, I'm tipping my hand at something. The original earth was perfect. Adam, Adam, our physical head, he was also created perfect. But the perfect became a ruin. Darkness abode on the face of the deep. We get that in verse 2. Man, after his fall, after he was ruined, was submerged in evil and enveloped in darkness. We see that in the world around us to this day. But we can see it in several different scriptures. Um, do I take the time? Maybe I will. Let me, let me back up and give you one, one scripture ahead then and go into this in depth since we're really not just trying to hurry through it. Why can I talk about a restoration of earth when we're talking about the creation of earth in, in chapter 1? Is there anything in scripture that gives us the idea that what we have recorded in 1 and 2 are a recreation? And I'll tell you right from the start, we see it. We see it from the Hebrew. If you don't know the Hebrew, that's okay. That's why we have teachers and why we have uh, things written down to help us learn and study. So let me just give you a real quick, we'll give you a lot more synopsis of the, I'm going to give you a synopsis today. I'll give you a lot more in detail um, the next class that we have. But verse 2 tells us in our English that the earth was without form and void. You may have formless and void or something like that, but those are the words that are used, that the earth was formless and void. Void means it's lacking, it's missing something, so to speak. Now, if verse 2 tells you that, keep that in your mind and go with me to Isaiah chapter 45. We're going to go to verse 18. Isaiah 45 and verse 18. Isaiah 45, 18 is speaking about this earth. And it says, For thus says the Lord. Okay. Hello. Didn't just say thus says Rochelle. Thus says the Lord. Remember, we don't care what Rochelle says. That doesn't matter. What the Lord says is what matters. Mm -hmm. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens. He is the God who formed the earth and he made it. He established it and he did not created a waste place but formed it to be inhabited. Okay, so he didn't create it void. He didn't create it what was our other word? Without form and void. He didn't create it without form. He didn't create it void. If I take you into the Hebrew, I will tell you in Genesis 1 verse 2 and in Isaiah 45 verse 18, it uses the very same Hebrew words, tofu behovohu, and I'll put that on the board, and I'll get it out to you all somehow when we get into our Hebrew lesson, when we're looking at that, but those words say that it was not created without form and void, it says it in, in Genesis 1-2, it says the earth was, and in Isaiah 45, it says that's not how God created it, so I'm just giving you a problem, is scripture contradicting itself? Do we have our first, uh-oh, one of these can't be inerrant? And it tell you, no. Because the same Hebrew that gives us that same word, when we go back to Genesis 1-2, literally says there, the earth became formless and void. We put it just as it was, but in Hebrew you've got more tenses than you have in English. And the Hebrew word tells us the earth became without form and void. Now it fits well with Isaiah who tells us it's not how God created it. Something apparently happened that caused it to become that way. And we no longer have a contradiction, but we have a big question mark. What happened? Stay tuned. Uh, I love to make you want to come back. <laughs> so yes, it's not the end of the story, and it's not the story for today. But knowing that this earth became ruined, now we can look at the fact that I was telling you that man also, when sin entered into man, he was submerged in this evil, he was enveloped in darkness. And, and again, 
we always want scripture to back up scripture. You don't want to ever build a doctrine on one verse, and if you can't see it in relation to other scripture, you're probably off on a limb that you're going to, it's going to break and you're going to fall. So let's see what scripture is telling us. In Isaiah 9, 1, it says, But there will be no more gloom for her, her who was in anguish. In earlier times he treated the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, with contempt, but later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, and it goes on. We go on to being told that the people walked in darkness, saw a great light, and we know that that's a reference to Messiah, the light of the world, that the light came into the world, but it's telling us they were sitting in darkness in verse 2. It's telling us that, that there, there won't be this gloom forever. Just as for the earth, this, this gloom, it wasn't forever, but it was there initially. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. Remember, I'd love to give you out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, a different time, a different author. We've got Sha'ol Paul, if you want to know who the author is. And it says, for you are all sons of light and sons of the day. You are not... Uh, of the night nor of darkness again we've moved from people who were in darkness to now people who are not in darkness we're going to move from a world that's dark and we're going to see that the world comes to life we know from John 3 19 you're used to 3 16 a wonderful verse but look at John 3 and verse 19 Yeshua is still speaking past verse 16 and he says this is the judgment the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Now we've got people wanting to sit in darkness, even though the light has come. Yes, ma'am. Can we kind of go back? Was you saying that God found the world without form and void? No. He found it? He didn't find it that way. <laughs> he did not create it that way. Oh. The earth became that way. The earth becomes found that way. When we read in verse 2 that we've got... We've got darkness on the face of the earth. We know something happened because it's not the way God created it. That's he why. Didn't find it that way. He didn't find it that way. God doesn't find anything. He's so, God, God's so the head he of it all. created it, but he didn't do anything with it until later. No, because it's not going to get it exactly right. God created this earth, I believe, perfectly. Something happened on this earth that caused it to become imperfect in its appearance. When we pick up in Genesis 1 verse 2 and following and we get what we call the creation of the earth, we're literally getting the recreation. We're getting the restoration that God took this that was now no longer a perfect environment and he's going to make it perfect for man to live in it. Okay, but it wasn't originally made that way. Let me ask you this. We know God spoke and things came into being. This, this is one of those questions, but I'm going to throw it out there. Can God create imperfect, incomplete, part way, half done? No, no. God does not create chaos. The world was found in chaos. The world was found and the world was found by us, I'm going to say as we read this not by God because God knows what happened and God's in control what happened. But what I'm saying is when God created the earth, when he spoke the earth into existence it was in a perfect form. Then it became without form and void. Then we get the bring it back into a state of form, not void and put man in it. That's what we're going to learn, is that something happened between Genesis 1-1, when in the beginning God created the earth, and Genesis 1-2, when the earth became without form and void. If you become something, there's been a change. You were alive. You were a human being. You had a last name. Then you married, and you've got a new name. You've become a wife. You've become, okay, how do I say it right? Uh, you belong to somebody else. Take that the right way, not the wrong way, okay? Partner. Hmm? partner. A partner. There you go. You've become a partner, okay? The earth was created. It was there. 
something happened to it that caused this formlessness, this void, and then it becomes something else because God restores it, and that's what we have recorded for us. So we don't have a recording of Genesis 1-1 explained. We have a recording of what happened after Genesis 1-1 explained. Question. Yes. Could it be when uh, Satan was sent down here with his followers and they kind of messed things up? You want a lesson that's coming in the future? You don't get it today. <laughs> There's, one like, There's one brainiac in every class. That would be the explanation. That's ours. explanation. <laughs> Is that the dinosaur era? <laughs> we got a lot of great questions coming and I love it that's what I want bring your brains into this classroom make them alive ask your questions I want this kind of feedback but I'm going to ask you hmm is it let's see if that's possible when we get there and study it let's see if you've got Rachel. the answer for when it what caused it to happen Rachel yes Naomi yeah I am sitting here wondering thinking that this could this be, you know, when Satan was cast out of heaven? This is what Roger was asking. <laughs> yes. And I'm thinking, okay, that, that makes sense. It does make sense, because doesn't by it? The time, by the time he put Adam and Eve on earth, evil had already presented itself. So was there evil in the Garden of Eden, or did evil enter into the Garden of Eden via Satan? That was the Garden evil. No. No. No, the Garden was not, but he... I love it. Slithered I love it. it. <laughs> let, let me just say, because God forbid anybody not make it back at the time when we talk about it, you all are on the right track. But we'll talk about it and prove it from the Word of God. We'll look at that. We'll look at when was Satan here? What was it like here? When did the change come? Why did the change come? Is that what took place between 1-1 one one and 1-2? One Is that the era of the dinosaurs? We'll look at all that. Some of it I think we can answer very almost dogmatically. Some of it we're going to have to have a little room to say, well, we're not exactly sure of you know every single detail, but we certainly can be sure of the overall, and we can see how it all fit in. We get, we get this via the Word of God. We're going to look at some other scripture in Isaiah that's going to talk about this earth. When did that take place? What does that mean? How did that happen? Because we know sin didn't enter this world that we know until Adam and Eve sinned. So you're all on the right track. You're all walking all around it. I'm just not going to give you complete answers and make you want to come back. <laughs> but in case if you can't keep studying on your own, you're on that right track. But we're going to see pictures from this. And that's why I was bringing out this about the earth becoming room. Because we're going to see as the earth was buried, so to speak, in its formlessness, that's going to speak of death. We see a deep, barren, and restless waters. That can be like when man became like the troubled sea, a spiritual death, when it can't rest and its waters are miry and, and kicking up dirt and, and causing problems, we can see a, a comparison here. We can learn spiritual lessons from it. And that's what we'll see as we go on. We'll look at that. Let me, let me tell you why I'm saying this, because this is what I want to bring out. The order that God used in the first four days of what I will call the restoration, and I'll prove why I say that in, in classes to come, it foreshadowed his work of grace in making a new creation of man. Okay, let's look at just those four days. Okay, we're going to look quickly because I want to finish it all in one class. The Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. We get that in verse 2. So the first step in restoration was divine activity. Earth couldn't resurrect itself, neither can man. The first step in salvation is the wooing of the Holy Spirit. No one comes to God by their own doing. They get tugged by God, and they respond to that tugging. That's called the wooing of the Holy Spirit. John 6, 44. Okay, if you were still in John 3, just flip over a couple pages. 
if you're not there and you don't have time, I'll read it for you. John 6, 44 says, <coughs> No one can come... I'm sorry, no one can come to me, Yeshua Jesus speaking, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So how do we come to the Father? I mean, how do we come to the Son? Only if the Father draws us. How does the Father draw you to his Son? By the work of the Holy Spirit within you, that tugs at you, that says, hey, Maybe this is right. Maybe this is something I need to, to believe in. Maybe this is something I need to look at. Let's look back at chapter 3. I forgot I was going to go there. I could have gone first. John 3, we know, is Nicodemus. In verse 5, Yeshua is talking to him and says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's human birth, and of the Spirit, that's a spiritual birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. And that's where Nicodemus scratches his head and says, you mean I've got to get back in my mother's womb? You know, that, that's impossible. I'm a huge man. He's trying to figure it, but he's trying to figure it on the fleshly level. And he gets told again, it's by spirit. Okay, so the first step to the restoration we see in the moving of the spirit. The first step that we see in the first days of creation, we see verse 2 told us the Spirit of God moved over the face of the earth. So um, what I want to bring out is God didn't forsake his ruined creation. He purposed to bring forth a new creation out of it, and that's the same for us. That God didn't purpose to leave us in a state of ruin, and that's it. Oh, how I thank God, no. But he wanted to bring us out of it. Praise his name. So, God said in verse 3, and the next step in, re in the recreation or the restoration is the spoken word of God. First step is the moving, the wooing of the Holy Spirit. The second step is the spoken word of God. He could have refashioned this earth. He could have refurnished it without speaking a word. He threw out the stars in space by his fingers, and they were there. But he intimates from the beginning that his purposes were to be worked out and his counsels to be accomplished by his word. He uses his word continually. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14 of John 1 tells us, and that was John 1, 1 tells us that that word tabernacled with mankind. We know in verse 4 it told us that it brought life and light into man. Remember man's in that darkness. So we see that God purposed by his word. He moves by his spirit. He speaks by his word and then he produces light by his word. Even so, salvation. I just quoted you John 1. 1. Let's look at 1. 4 because I only alluded to it. I, I quoted 1.1, 1, 1, that the beginning was the Word, was with God, the Word was God. Verse 4, in Him was life. Life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. Remember, the people were in that darkness. Now go down to verse 9. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Remember, they sat in darkness, but the light came into the world. And those who come into the light come into the sun. The sun is the way to the Father. So we have the Holy Spirit wooing. We have God speaking by his word. We have him producing the light by his word. Salvation also is by light coming to us, the word of God coming to us, shining into our lives, bringing us out of that darkness and into the light of his word. Psalm 119, 130 also. Coming up. Takes a while to scroll through a tablet. Says the unfolding of your words, God's words, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Hallelujah. That's me. <laughs> the simple. It didn't say to the scientist. It didn't say to the one who, who becomes scholarly and the one who, who gets a degree and the one who really works at it. It says that it gives understanding to the simple. It is so simple, even a child can understand the light of the world for salvation. I love it. He knew me. 
the next step in God's creation that we're going to see is God divided the light from the darkness. And we'll go through this in detail when we get in, in Genesis 1-1, but that's verse 4. Fallen man lives in the domination and the darkness of his soul. The soul is the seat of his emotions, his passions, his lust, everything. But the rekindled spirit of the regenerated man is light. It is separate from the nature of darkness. We take on a new life. We're a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If it's not second, it's first, but I think it's second. And we have many other scriptures. So I'll give you 1 John 2. 1 John 2. I'll give you some others to look up on your own. But we'll look at 1 John 2. And we're going to start with verse, two, uh, verse 8. I'm sorry. Chapter 2 and verse 8. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away. The true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness till now. And it goes on telling you the difference in verse 11. But the one who hates his brother uh, walks in darkness. I wanted it. Okay, it still talks about the if you're in hatred, you're not in the light. But I want you to see that the light is separate from the darkness. You can live in the light, you're not in that darkness, and your deeds will not be dark deeds. There will be a change. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Let's see if that's a little more concise. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. I see us running out of time. That's why I'm hurrying. For God who said, light shall shine out of the darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Yeshua, in the face of Jesus, in the face of Christ, the anointed one. And we know he is the light. So uh, other verses you can look at, Ephesians 5, verses 8 and 11. These are on your cross references that I gave you. And Colossians 3, 9 and 10. So again, the spirit would... God spoke with his word. He produced light by his word. He divided the light from the darkness. That's that rekindled spirit. And the, the next step, God separated the firmament from the waters. That's verses 6 and 7. You've got the formation of the atmospheric heavens, and that corresponds to the new nature that's imparted into the believer. We now have a heavenly nature. We have the nature of God that is now put in us. 2 Peter 1, 4. 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. 2 Peter 1, 4, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. Corruption, dark, the evil, the lust of the world. We escape that by being in the light. How are we in the light? Because he puts his divine nature in us. We are now separated by our spiritual nature from the darkness and from the world. Uh, that was 2 Peter 1, 4. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Look at 1 John 4, 12 and 13. Uh, sorry, I got lost. They're on your cross-references. They'll be on there, on that paper. So, no problem. I'm basically saying it for Zoom World um, and YouTube later. But if you got lost, let me say it again. We were in 2 Peter 1, 4. That's the one we read. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and 1 John 4, 12 and 13. So our next step is God caused the dry land to appear and the vegetation to appear where there had only been desolation and a death of sorts. Now life and fertility appears in verses 9 through 11. Even so, the one who produced nothing but dead works, that's all we can do before we're saved, now we're fitted by having that divine nature in us to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit to God's glory. And uh, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, uh, 6, you know, the fruit of the spirits that are listed there. Um, let's look also at Matthew 13, 23. Matthew 13 and verse 23. 
Matthew 13, verse 23. And the one to whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Some do more, some do less, but they all bring forth that fruit. So we're able to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit when God's put His divine nature in us. So when we look at these steps in creation, we can look at them of our being created spiritually, our second birth. We see that by the, the first um, description that, that I gave you, uh, the order of the first four days of restoration that we see. Next week, I'm going to bring to you, unless I run us over, I'm deciding how fast I can do it. I think I'd rather bring it out next week. It is my final thought, though. Anyone in trouble at 3.30? Can we go another few minutes? <laughs> Patty's used to be a girl. <laughs> Our new one. Are you good with it? I'm good. Okay. I'm okay. I'm good. No one's saying that, that they can't. If you have to get the end later, get the end later. But it, it'll give us this whole thought. And then we'll be ready for that first Hebrew lesson of verse 1 next time. And we won't get into the total question of, of the change until we get past that lesson and then get into verse 2 where we get the tahu bavahu. Okay, Yeshua Jesus, his redemption is set forth also in the first four days of the recreation of the earth. So the same way I just gave you how we become a new person, that new spiritual life. Now let me show you Jesus' work of redemption in the first four days. The first day, Genesis 1, 2 to 5, speaks of the incarnation. It speaks of the birth and the manhood. Okay, the Holy Spirit hovers over, he brooded over the face of the waters in verse 2. Well, we see in Scripture, look it up on your own, but Luke one thirty five tells us that the Holy Spirit hovered over, brooded over, overshadowed Mary. We call her Miriam in our Hebrew, the one who God put the conception of Yeshua in her womb. Wait, how did, how did Yeshua Jesus get in the womb of a woman? By the Holy Spirit. And there are those who say, yeah, how could you ever believe that? Well, hello. Mm -hmm. If God could create this entire earth and universe and galaxies and what all goes beyond all of that, what is it for him to put seed in a woman? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, but the first step, the first day, we see the incarnation. We see that, that it's the Holy Spirit working, wooing and working. Okay, God's word issued forth as light. We know that Genesis 1-3, that, that God brought forth the light. And we've already said that Yeshua, the word of God, came forth as light into the world. Remember, we read that in John 1, in those verses. Verse 1, verse 4, verse 9, read them again. But let me show you also Luke 2, 28-32. Luke 2, 28-32. Okay, I know I made a mistake. There we go. Luke 2, 28 through 32, and we read there. Then he took him into his arms and blessed, blessed God and said, Okay, who is this? Let me back you up to verse 25, and it will tell you that there was a man in Jerusalem in Jerusalem whose name was Shimon, Simeon in your English. The man was righteous and devout. He was looking for the consolation, the hope of Israel. We know that Yeshua Jesus is the hope of Israel. The Holy Spirit was on this one. He sees this one brought into the temple. Miriam and Yosef brought little baby Yeshua into the temple at the time that they were to offer this offering for him in Jewish tradition because he was born to a Jewish family keeping the Jewish law, okay? When Shimon Simeon saw him, he said, Now, Lord, you're releasing your bond, per, bond servant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So we have Yeshua Jesus being referred to as the light, the revelation, even to the Gentiles, as well as the glory, light to the Jewish people. So the Holy Spirit hovered. 
we see God issued forth light, and we see the light came into the world. The light was approved by God. Verse 4, Genesis 1 says that God said it was good. Yeshua was approved by God. Luke 2, 52. I'm, uh, I think I'm there, aren't I? Yeah, I'm in Luke 2, so just drop down to verse 52. And in verse 52 we have, And Yeshua Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So God's approving of him as he's growing up. Luke 3 and verse 22 we have, and this is when Yeshua went into the waters of baptism. It was not baptism for the repentance of sin. Yeshua had no sin he needed to repent from, but he had to go through a ceremonial cleaning, cleansing, so to speak, the mikvah, that allowed him to step into the priestly role. So this is what his baptism really was a picture of for him. When he came up out of the waters, the Holy Spirit, the the Ruch HaKodesh descended upon him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came out of heaven you are my beloved son in you I am well pleased God said it was good teaser for future classes out of all the days of God's creation there's one day that's not said that it was good your homework figure out which day and why I'm talking about creation in Genesis. Was it a picture of crucifixion? Is Dora onto something? Let's find out in the next class or a couple classes down the line. Okay, so the light is approved by God. God says Yeshua was good. The light was separated from the darkness. Remember, we read that step, Genesis 1 4. Yeshua was separate from sinners. Hebrews, book of better. Hebrews 7, verse 26. And we read in 7.26, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest. This is describing Yeshua. He's our high priest. Holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Was Yeshua separate from sinners? Absolutely. The light of the Messiah was separated from the darkness of fallen humanity. He wasn't a fallen, sinful human being. That's why he could give his blood in our place. And God gave the light a name in Genesis 1-5. Let's look at that so you know I'm, I'm staying on track with Genesis. Genesis 1-5, God called the light day. The darkness he called night. There was evening and morning, the day one or one day. We'll talk about all that in detail later. But God gave the light a name, Yeshua the light of the world was named by God. Matthew, good Jewish book written by a good Jewish author to a Jewish audience. I'd like to call them good, but ones who came to believe were good. <laughs> okay, Genesis 1, 21. Oh, sorry, Matthew, Matthew. Matthew, Matthew 1, 21 says, She, Miriam, will bear a son, capital S, the son of God. You shall call his name Jesus. Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. God named him. That is his name. Okay, that's all the first day. We see the incarnation, his birth, his manhood. We see it all the way through. Second day, and here's where Dora's right on track, comes to, it speaks of the cross by way of division and separation. The firmament and the atmospheric heavens were separated the waters above from the waters below. Well, the cross separated the sun below from the Father above. Matthew 27, 46. Matthew 27 and verse 46. Matthew 27, 46, we read about the ninth hour, Yeshua Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was a separation between the Father and the Son when he was he became the sin offering for us. The cross separated Yeshua from the land of the living. He died. He didn't swoon. He didn't wake up later. He didn't come back to his senses in a cool tomb and, and walk out of the tomb, how he could roll back a stone that took a number of people to move into place. 
they can't answer that either. But anyway, it says Isaiah 53 and verse 8, By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off, violently cut off from the Hebrew, out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. So the people deserved that killer blow, but he took it and it cut them off from the land of the living. Yeshua, Jesus, died. It was in the mind of God, verse 6, and before it was accomplished, God said, let there be. The cross was planned, we're told, from the foundation of the world. Not after Adam sinned, not God saying, oops, I've got a problem. But it was before the foundation of the world. That's Revelation 13, 8 and Acts 2, 23. I'll let you read it on your own. Almost to my final point for today. The firmament was set in the midst of the waters. Yeshua, Jesus, was crucified in the midst of the people. We know that the, the, he had the two being crucified right Right with him. We know that it was on a thoroughfare, the people walking past and seeing it, all of that going on. In scripture, waters represents people. Revelation 17, 15 is one of the easiest places to see that. But uh, what we're seeing is that um, Yeshua was in the midst of the people, crucified in the midst of the people, in the midst of the two thieves. The firmament was set in the midst of the waters. So the cross divides people even as the firmament divided the waters. How does the cross divide 1 Corinthians 1.18? 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. We know the cross is a stumbling block, especially to the Jewish people. But those who come to believe, it ends up being the power of God and the salvation. So we see in the, that beginning, in the, the first day, in the second day, we see that it, it's talking about, um, well, the first day, his incarnation, the second day, his crucifixion. And I will go ahead and, and say it now because Dora brought it out. That's the day that God doesn't say, and it was good. That part is omitted because at the close of the second day is typifying the cross where God was dealing with sin, and sin is not good. Nor is the cross good. The results are good, but that wasn't good. God wasn't saying that was good. But the third day, and this is the only day that he says twice it was good. It's almost as if it's doubly good for the lack being on the day before. And by the way, Jewish people that follow Judaism want to be married on the third day of the week because it's the day God blessed twice. Uh -huh. So they often do marriages on what is Tuesday for them. Just a side note. But the third day that's blessed twice, God said it was good twice, is the speaking of his resurrection. He says it was good in Genesis 1, 9 and 1, 12, the two times. And on the third day, life appeared out of the barren earth. Life appears out of death. Messiah arose on the third day. So that third day now speaks of his resurrection. So we have his incarnation and his, um, what was the other incarnation? And his, his manhood is growing up in day one. We have the cross in day two. We have the resurrection in day three. And the fourth day speaks of his ascension into the heavens. That's Genesis 1, 14 to 19. Our attention is removed from the earth. We're going to look at the heavens. We're going to see two great lights that refer to the Messiah, the sun, and to his people, the moon. We'll see that when we get into it. That they ref uh, the people will reflect the light, like the moon reflects the light of the sun. The people will reflect the light of Messiah who is now seated in the heavens. He's no longer on earth. He is in the heavens. We know in Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Adonai, uh, I'm sorry, Jehovah God the Father saying to Adonai the Son. That's how the Lord said unto my Lord. It's done through David. But Acts 2, 33 through 35 also gives us that where we, well, let's read that real quick. That'll be our last verse that, that we'll be reading today. Acts 2, 33 to 35, and we read in these verses. 
Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, and, and he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and and Messiah and Christ, this Yeshua Jesus whom you crucified. So we see that, that this is reflecting his ascension into heaven and the sitting at the right hand of the Father is the fourth day speaks to that. One day he will come as son of righteousness. Um, in Malachi, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, it uses S-U-N, but we know that the symbolically speaking of the Son of Righteousness, who the whole world will see, every eye will see, Revelation 1-7, his return. That's when he will be the light of the world when he sets up his millennial kingdom. But the whole world, like the lightning seen from the east to the west, will see the Son of Righteousness come with healing in his wings. So as we begin the count, as we see in just the first four days, the whole, the whole uh, promise of the coming of God in human form to die, raise from the dead, and ascend back into heaven for the sake of mankind, to save mankind and to give mankind a future and a hope that is heavenly, we see in, in just this, just this beginning, we see the count of creation, the restoration that God is giving teaches on more than one level. We get it because we, this tells us how our world came into the form that it's in, but we see there was a far deeper meaning pictured in all of this. That's when we need to remember that the Bible, and Genesis I'll say in particular right now, does not tell us how the heavens go. God isn't going to give us a scientific explanation of how everything stays in space and how it all works. He's not going to tell us how the heavens go scientifically. He does hit on science, and it's always accurate. But more importantly, it tells us how to go to heaven through the death, burial, resurrection of our Son who rose from the dead, who is the Son of God, who took our place in, in suffering the consequences of sin, which is death giving us his perfect blood that we would have his life. Isn't that wonderful? Out of the first four days, the first few verses, we haven't even gotten out of Genesis 1, and we're going to go back to the very beginning, a very good place to start. <laughs> and we're going to start with the first three words in Hebrew in our next lesson and see them in that kind of depth and detail again, because this is all I can say in my simple mind is, wow. Oh, <laughs> this is how great our God is. He is more than one-dimensional level in our reading, and we want to see as much of the full picture as our little peon brains can comprehend today. And as we grow in the Lord and as we finally will be with him, I know we'll see and learn on a greater level. But I hope it's been a blessing today. I have run us over. My apologies, but I want to give you that completeness, especially to finish that picture. I love the pictures that scriptures draw for us. And the best is yet to come. We're only scratching the surface. We're only just, dare I say it, bare as sheet. Beginning. <laughs> okay? Questions, comments? Are you going to tell us what happens from, from one to two? Yes. I absolutely am. It probably will be the second class after because the first class will still be in 1-1. In one, one. I doubt we'll get all the way to 1-2. But if we do, then you'll get your answer no, no, in, in one class. How you said God created it perfect mm -hmm. and then it was upside down. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll get next week we're going to get Bereshit Bara Elohim. Then we'll get past that to where we get Tohu Bavohu. And we'll talk about how did that happen then? If God created it perfect, how do we have an imperfect that's being recreated? We will answer that question, like I say, either in a, a long first class or it'll be the next class right after that. But it's coming. I won't leave you cliffhanging too long. <laughs> okay, remember next week I'm not here though, Dora, you weren't here to hear that. Next week we're not here. So October 20th, no class. Resume October 27th. We're just missing one week. Stay tuned, but possibly here.
The fact that everybody who's showing up here can show up easier at my house, <laughs> or as easy with the exception of maybe Pam, she's the only one on this side. We'll see. We'll see. I need to talk with a few others who said they were coming and find out, you know, what's really happening. But what's we'll... easiest for you? For me, it's probably a home because he doesn't have to. Look yeah. yeah, and he did work me out far better. I love, I can see all my Zoom people real well today, much better than last week. So it's a learning curve, you know, and we'll do whatever we need to do. He doesn't mind. Yes, yes. Uh, let me close in prayer, and then I'll give them to you. And again, those of you in Zoom world, if you held on to your cross-references from before, they're the same. If you lost them or you need them again, just let me know, because that's what I passed out to everyone else, okay? But let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Hello, hey Israel, our God of Israel, we, we thank you, divine creator of the universe. We thank you for showing us your power, your magnificence, your amazing mind that, that is so multi-level that we cannot begin to comprehend with our human little peon brains. But thank you for the pictures you have given us. The joy it gives us in our hearts to see that even this creation pictures you and the love you had for us that you were willing to leave heaven to die for us, to raise from the dead for us, to be at the right hand of the Father interceding for us today. Our hearts just thrill. We are filled with your joy, and we are so thankful that we fall on our faces before you in respect and adoration and honor and in thanksgiving. Lord, you are an awesome God. Thank you for the privilege of opening your word, studying and learning, and enlighten us, Lord, as we contemplate what we've learned today. Let us take it all week, chew on it, and even find new from it, because we know we can never fathom the depths of your word or the heights either. Thank you, Lord, for um, what you do give us, and we're open to all the more that we can handle. <laughs> to you be glory forever and ever. In the name of Yeshua Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior, Amen. Amen.